The mystery of life, a challenge to the human mind ever since time began, answered instinctively by the development of all the world's religions, basic impetus of centuries of painstaking research. The solution, not mere satisfaction of idle curiosity, but a new and better rule for future living, new safeguards for human happiness. Important contributions have been made through the related sciences of archaeology and anthropology. Nothing yet as to how human life originated, but at least a thread laboriously woven as to where, and as to the geographical direction of man's journeyings from slow and painful beginnings somewhere in the subtropical regions of the Mediterranean basin or of southern Asia. Ever struggling upward with the passage of millennia, man pressed eastward and northward as far as the great ice cap would permit. At last the world's climate grew warmer, the ice cap began to retreat, and finally, a means of progress was opened from Asia across narrow Bering Strait. Some unknown Columbus discovered America perhaps 10,000 years ago. Southward were more favorable climes, and these first inhabitants of America spread and multiplied. Civilizations rose and fell. From one of these in what is now Mexico, centuries ago, an upsurge of culture poured into the region of our lower Mississippi Valley. All this information is the result of the same sort of conscientious research as that at Mound State Park in Alabama. Nature unadorned is no fickle jade. Change, as the scientist sees it, is a process extremely slow. Contrary to popular belief, where it has remained untouched by human agencies, the Earth today is much the same as it was when human life began. Thousands of years ago, the same beautiful clouds rolled over Alabama, and down from her interior on its way to the sea flowed the stream now called the warrior. Here, it is within the short memory of the present generation that human agencies have wrought their change. Centuries ago, there were broad, deep pools and shoals where Mother Earth's rocky skeleton lay bare, pools that abounded in fish, shoals that were paved with mussels whose iridescent shells tossed back in sparkling splendor sunlight caught from cloud-flecked skies above. Today, a system of federal-owned locks keeps the warrior's waters at a constant navigable level while modern riverboats nurse their broods of barges up and down between the industrial city of Birmingham to the north and the proud old Gulf port of Mobile to the south. The story of Mound State Park at Moundville, Alabama, is one of this river of antiquity and of the warrior of today, reminiscent of a strange, peace-loving, industrious, and highly organized people who were led to their home by the river's friendly waters, fished its pools for much of their subsistence, and used its shells to express an appreciation of beauty which has remained across the ages to mark them a race of superior intelligence. A story of the warrior, too, current in its application to modern ideas of public recreation. From the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, along which the civilization traveled to Moundville, is about 225 miles by way of the Tom Bigby and Warrior Rivers, natural waterways for the ancient inhabitants. Moundville was the center of the culture, although there are minor evidences of it at three other nearby places. In the central part of this ancient city, there are 34 mounds in a clustered group, 18 of which form a hollow square, most of them oriented very close to the cardinal points of the compass. They are medium to large mounds, and all of them of the truncated pyramid type. The entire metropolis comprised about 300 acres, part of which is now occupied by the town of Moundville. It is on the central tract of 175 acres owned by the Alabama Museum of Natural History and embracing the principal mounds that Mound State Park is being developed. These Moundville people have been called an industrious people. 
the magnitude of the task they performed in building the mounds may be cited as proof. The largest mound is 58 and one half feet high and covers about one and three quarter acres. It was once, like all the others, sharply rectangular, almost square. 28 of the mounds have been measured. They contain approximately 350,000 cubic yards of packed dirt. There is reason to believe that the dirt was carried in woven baskets, each holding about 35 pounds, more than 100 basket loads to the cubic yard. Using the estimate of 20 minutes as the time required to make a round trip with one basket load, one arrives at the astounding total of more than a million man days of work. That is, one man toiling from sun up till sundown for more than 4,500 years. The population of the area probably never exceeded 3,000. Occupancy and this amazingly industrious mound building must have continued over a long period. Prodigious energy in glorification of some deity, for all these mounds are of the ceremonial or domiciliary class. They're not burial mounds. Atop most of them, if not all, were temples. Ramp construction is a detail which seems to link them to earlier structures in Middle America. The construction method of both temples and dwellings, the latter clustered about the mounds, has been established. Green saplings of appropriate size were embedded in trenches and drawn together at the top by withes of cane and reed. There were circular bowl-shaped fireplaces in the centers of both temples and dwellings, and the smoke curled out through holes left in the roofs. Formal seats of the same modeled clay as that in the fireplaces are still found in both temples and dwellings, for the ceremonial chief in the temple and for the patriarchal master in the dwelling. Plaster made of mud and cane leaves was used in the lower part of each structure. A thatch of cane leaves and grass covered the upper portion. In excavating, as the basis for scientific conclusion, meticulous care must be exercised. Any single square inch of the entire 175 acres at Moundville may disclose invaluable information. Here is a practical example of searching for a needle in a haystack. The first step is to plot the area into uniform mathematical squares. These squares and numbers on a corresponding sheet record absolutely everything of interest that is found. There is reason to believe that in the Moundville culture scheme of things, cemeteries as we know them were not important. The living kept their dead very near to them. Burials were apparently made underneath the dirt floor of the house in which the family of the deceased was living at the time. Pits were about 18 inches deep. Bodies were usually fully extended on their backs. Bundle burials were rare. Stone discs and slabs are characteristic of the Moundville culture, more than 80 of such objects having been found. They are invariably made of sandstone, similar to material outcroppings above Tuscaloosa, about 18 miles to the north. Not only is their mechanical precision remarkable, but also the incised designs with which they are decorated. With the use of only primitive tools, the task of making such an object as the well-known rattlesnake disc must have been a tremendous one. Versed in the lore of some of the ancient orders that hark back into ancient days will be stirred by some of the objects that have been uncovered. They'll see significance in the all-seeing eye, a decorative design which appears frequently. If objects associated with their owner during his lifetime were buried with him, and they undoubtedly were, they'll find their own meaning in a ceremonial mace, which might have been a gavel, and in an incised pendant, which may have been a charm. And even in the days of these Moundville people, there seems to have been some significance in the number seven, for ornamental beads in this exact number were used. Ancient civilizations are rarely thought of as having existed where we of today go about our routine tasks. Remains of the past are most frequently unearthed in far off places. At Moundville, this culture of centuries ago has been uncovered in fields long planted to cotton on the edge of a sleepy little southern town, and within a few minutes of the seat of Alabama's foremost state educational institution. Plows turned up the first recognizable evidences of it 40 or 50 years ago. Burials are now uncovered by the simple process of removing a few shovels full of loose earth until a stratum of harder clay is reached, a natural base on which human bodies and cherished worldly treasures were tenderly placed in the dim and distant past. It is weird and eerie to find with so little effort a fireplace unquestionably fashioned by man which can be used today exactly as it was so long ago, or a cache of mussel shells, exactly the same as those found in nearby streams, which may have been dumped into a garbage pit in the earliest days of man's occupancy of the North American continent. 
In the development of Mound State Park with federal aid through the Civilian Conservation Corps as a recreational area with unparalleled educational features, it is planned merely to uncover some of the most interesting burials and preserve them for the public to see and to study. An early structure was a frame building over a number of burials with a runway entirely around it on the inside, from which one might look down on original clay bases, each supporting a burial of human remains and artifacts. Plans for the future include the erection of a splendid stone structure which will cover a larger area of burials in similar fashion. Carefully indexed in racks in the Alabama Museum of Natural History, 3,000 of these Moundville culture people which have been recovered during the past few years. On scientific examination and measurement of these bones are based many of the interesting deductions which have been made, not only as to the physical characteristics, but also as to the habits of these first citizens of Alabama. In only two instances have skulls indicated death as the result of violence. Here was a race of peaceful people. Bone measurements have established the average stature of the adult as about five feet three and three quarter inches. The Moundville culture man was noticeably smaller and much more delicate in bone structure and features than the popular conception of the American Indian. In the 3,000 cases available for examination, there are, of course, the bones of both men and women and of all ages. There are indeed the bones of unborn babes. Approximate age of the individuals is determined to some extent by the teeth, which are present in most of the skulls uncovered. The artifacts recovered are just as carefully stored for repeated examination. While many pieces of pottery, most surprisingly, are recovered in exactly the same condition they were centuries ago when they were buried, it is often necessary to reconstruct vessels from scores of pieces found in the same burial. This young lady is an expert in jigsaw puzzling along extremely practical lines. When pieces are missing, they are filled in with plaster of Paris through the use of an interesting technique. On pieces selected for public exhibition, a final step in the restoration is the definition of the incised designs with white paint. Pottery making seems to have been the chief art of the Moundville culture people. Pots, bowls, and water bottles are the pieces most frequently found. They are shell-tempered and of several types of ware. Pots are normally plain except for handles and effigy shapes. Many of the bowls are adorned with splendid designs and water bottles often carry the most elaborate engravings. Individualism of design was the established rule. Rarely is a duplicate found. Relief ornamentation is usually an effigy of the frog, the duck, the beaver, the bat, the eagle, the owl, the rabbit, fish and conch shells, grotesque animals, and human beings. Pieces in which the entire structural design, not merely the ornamentation, is in effigy are the most interesting. It is not so much the manufacture of pottery, although a remarkable percentage of it is excellent ware, but rather the intricate and delicate incised designs which give the Moundville culture pottery such a distinct and interesting type. As a rule, the incised lines are so delicately executed that one can scarcely feel them with the fingers. Water bottles provide the best examples of this incision work. Indeed, water bottles without this treatment are rare. Among the designs are the plumed serpent, ivory-billed woodpecker, eagle, sun, hand and conventional eye, skull and forearm bones, meander and scroll. Art objects for personal adornment were mostly shell. Little metal is found. From the large marine conch shells, fulgur perversum, were cut lovely gorgets, elaborately carved and decorated. Large beads, often weighing one ounce each, were cut from the columella of the shell. 
They were strung on thread and worn about the neck, wrists, and ankles. As many as 1,000 beads of various kinds have been found with a single burial. No war clubs, bludgeons, or instruments of violence among the objects uncovered, which were obviously associated with the daily lives of the people. More than 15,000 artifacts and only 79 arrowheads. A peaceful people indeed, not a race of killers. The bone tools which flaked off the arrow flints were more extensively used for homely occupations. Moundville folk fished the warrior which flowed past their city of temples in peace with crude hooks like these, bones sharpened and polished. While paint is rarely found on pottery, the frequency with which it is encountered in burials and refuse heaps suggests its common use for some other purpose, perhaps for personal adornment. Grinding and cutting stones of varying degrees of hardness frequently found explain the manufacture of the discs. Stones almost identical are used today in Alabama's important marble industry. Stones for another use, pipes. So few are found that they may have been community, not individual possessions. There's tobacco ash in each. Bones like the ones used to make implements are found. The lower part of the leg of the wild turkey made the most common of the awls. Mute shadows of ancient animal life, not greatly different from that of the area today. The Civilian Conservation Corps participation at Mound Park is varied. Under expert supervision, the boys are doing the excavating. On the mounds, they are repairing the damage already done by soil erosion and effecting safeguards against similar damage in the future. They're scheduled to build various park structures, including the museum. For the many people already visiting the park, and the record has been showing more than a thousand a month, they serve as guides, not only on the park property, but at control points along the nearby highways. Informal group lectures in the park are given by trained technicians, but the boys have become so well informed on the subject that they answer intelligently most questions asked them. The core association with Mound State Park exemplifies one of those fine underlying principles of the Civilian Conservation Corps movement sometimes overlooked. Wherever the Corps works, there are agencies and individuals just as much interested in the boys themselves as in their work. Here, it's the Alabama Museum of Natural History. Few boys who have worked at Mound State Park have failed to profit from educational help not only offered, but pressed upon them by the museum officials. Their interest has been stirred not only by Moundville culture artifacts, but also by other museum research, notably the discovery of the petrified remains of prehistoric animals which swam over much of the present area of Alabama when it was ocean bed. While the educational features will always predominate, the area is well adapted to the more obvious forms of recreation. Along the river are beautiful wooded gullies, and here the Corps has built a system of foot trails. Luscious fried chicken, southern style, is already appearing with great regularity on park picnic tables. Under the plan of development, children and adults are playing in the same waters and amid practically the same scenic charms as were present centuries ago when the Moundville culture was born. Music